So good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Declan Murphy, urologist and director of GU Oncology here at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. I'm joined by my co-host and guest speaker this morning, Professor Michael Hoffman, a nuclear medicine physician here at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you to another uh, Prostate PCF, Prostate Cancer Foundation webinar. And we've had really good feedback in the past uh, year over the format of some of these webinars and the content. So we're very grateful to those of you who've joined us before and who have sent us suggestions for this webinar. And we're also very grateful for those of you who've joined today from all over the world. Michael will tell us a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. So today the focus is on the therapy study uh, recently presented by Michael at ASCO GU and published in The Lancet. Uh, it's a randomized trial of lutetium PSMA versus cabazitaxel. So I think we all know this is a very hot topic in prostate cancer and we're looking forward to what we're describing as a deep dive into this today. Um, following Michael's presentation, we have a, a, a very uh, knowledgeable panel uh, who will discuss the topics and we certainly welcome your input. So please use the question and answer function uh, in Zoom. Please Please vote up the questions that you like the look of, and we're going to have a plenty of time for a robust discussion of this topic uh, later on in the webinar. So, Michael, I'll hand over to you uh, to get things going and um, introduce our uh, co-hosts uh, from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Thank you so much, Declan, and welcome to everyone from around the world. I think uh, we have around 300 people online and around 750 registered, so no doubt that will grow uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to uh, Howard Sewell and Andrea Mia Hira from the uh, US-based Prostate Cancer Foundation. They are uh, supporting our program uh, here at Peter Mac through a center of excellence. Uh, so we'll let them uh, say a little introduction about themselves and then uh, we'll go into the ASCO GU uh, talk. Uh, then we'll introduce some special guests that are all on the line who have had an immense uh, contribution to this uh, ANZ UP therapy study. And then we'll uh, take questions from uh, all around the world. So over to you, Howard and Andrea. Thank you, Michael. I am Howard Sewell, the Chief Science Officer at the Prostate Cancer Foundation in Los Angeles, California. I'm joined uh, by my science partner, Dr. Mia Hira. Uh, we're very pleased to be here today. Uh, Michael and Declan, thank you for continuing this awesome to inform the world about great research in patients with um, radionuclide uh, theranostics. We're, we're really pleased with your work. I do want to make one acknowledgement, which is to an individual from Norway named Stein Eric Hagen, who through PCF has made a substantial multi-year um, programmatic gift to the Peter Mac. It's not just money floating from heaven. It supports uh, a great deal of the clinical science and even now so starting to support some of the, the fantastic basic science of Peter Mack. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Hagen. And Andrea, if you'd like to say a few words, please. Sure, thank you, Howard. I'm Andrea Miahira, the Director of Global Research and Scientific Communications at PCF. Um, and I just wanna thank my Michael and Declan for having this webinar. These Prostic-led um, webinars have been just a really fantastic addition to our, our global webinars, so thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Howard and Andrea. Uh, your support has been amazing over the last uh, few years. Uh, so we'll dive into our deep dive. This is uh, just some stats from this morning. Uh, 755 registrants from uh, 54 countries. You can see the uh, breakdown of countries there. We'll uh, share these stats uh, afterwards, uh, but a lot of uh, registrants from Mexico, interestingly, and South Africa, and a good number from uh, Brazil and uh, Germany and Canada. So, but well represented across the board. Very uh, impressive to see so much interest from really all corners of the of the planet. So we're here today to uh, really deep dive into this Lancet publication that was presented at ASCO GU. Uh, so many of you will be uh, familiar with this and have read it, but some of you uh, may not be so familiar. So I'm going to start with my uh, a version of my ASCO GU uh, presentation. Uh, this was really an enormous effort over the last uh, five years by a really huge uh, multidisciplinary team. And apart from the amazing novel science in this project, I think uh, the most amazing thing about this uh, project was bringing to together all these partners from 
uh, such discrepant groups. Uh, so this trial was run by the ANZUP at Cancer Trials Group and having a cooperative clinical trials group uh, overseeing everything and getting everyone together uh, was really critical. And, and this network of people were not working together uh, prior to this study in, in many institutions. The nuclear medicine people were stuck in their uh, dark rooms uh, and didn't even know who their medical oncology uh, colleagues were, to be honest. And, and through this study, we really brought together nuclear medicine and medical oncology at all these 11 sites around Australia. Uh, but we also got clinical trial staff, uh, the NHNMRC CTC that ran the trial. Uh, I think medical oncologists are very familiar with clinical trials, but nuclear medicine people are not. Uh, so we got nuclear medicine people uh, conducting clinical trials in a really rigorous way. And another important group was the Australian Radiopharmaceutical Trials Network. And we'll hear from uh, Ros Francis later in standardizing some of the radiochemistry. Uh, so the lutetium PSMA 617, uh, now provided by uh, Novartis uh, during this trial, was made in hospital radiopharmacies at each of these 11 sites, which was quite an amazing undertaking uh, to standardize those procedures. It was an enormous uh, volume of work. And uh, another special link here is ANSTO, who manufacture no carrier added lutetium 177 in Australia. Uh, and uh, obviously the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia who funded this uh, study uh, together with a number of community partners, including Movember. And uh, so a real incredible effort of both talent, uh, industry involvement, philanthropic involvement and community uh, involvement to make this trial happen. And it was my real pleasure to present it on behalf of all the uh, co-investigators at the ASCO GU meeting. Uh, just over a, uh, a week ago. Uh, so in this trial, we are using PSMA Theranostics. This is a combination of uh, PSMA PET imaging to select men who are then suitable for uh, lutetium PSMA 617 uh, therapy. We did the first prospective trial of this agent at uh, Peter Mac uh, back in 2015 and uh, reported a 64% response rate in uh, men who had really failed conventional therapies. That's what led to this therapy trial. Uh, but if we go a little bit further, we have a lot of our German colleagues on the line, uh, and they were really pivotal in doing the first compassionate access treatments of this treatment, of this therapy, which alerted us in Australia to this. And uh, we really adopted this technology. And, and what we've done differently is conducted a really robust uh, clinical trial. Uh, but it has been the efforts of many. And if we go back even further, uh, the USPCF that are really supporting us uh, invested in PSMA Target over 20 years ago uh, through Well Cornell in the USA uh, and did a lot of work around antibodies targeted. So a huge amount of collaborative work from all corners of the, work, of the world to get to this point where we're able to do this uh, randomized trial. So we took men who had progressed after docetaxel with a rising PSA and a PSA over 20, and they underwent a PSMA and FDG PET CT. And uh, they were centrally reviewed and then randomized one to one to either lutetium PSMA 617 up to six cycles or carbazitaxel, a standard dose of 20 milligrams per meter squares up to 10 cycles. And uh, in the lutetium arm, men underwent a SPECT CT and a small proportion of men who had a what we called an exceptional response, which was disappearance of uh, PSMA avid disease suspended treatment that happened in around 7% of men. And they remained on trial and they recommenced cycling of lutetium upon progression. So it became an intermittent therapy for those uh, men. Uh, it was an open label trial. So we did have more withdrawals in the carbazitaxel arm. And uh, that was uh, probably because those men wanted lutetium therapy. And once they were randomized to carbazitaxel, uh, some of these men uh, sought lutetium PSMA therapy elsewhere. So there is a little bit of a uh, bias there in the intention to treat uh, population. Uh, with our PET imaging, around 30% of men were deemed unsuitable uh, on the basis of either low PSMA expression in around 10% or what we call FDG discordant disease in 20% of men. Our primary endpoint was a PSA reduction over 50% and that occurred in 66% of men randomized to lutetium PSMA and 37% of men randomized to carbazitaxel. So that's a 29% absolute improvement in that primary endpoint uh, favoring lutetium PSMA, really a large difference, a very pleasing uh, result. These are the patient characteristics. It's important to note that the majority of these men had also progressed after either abiraterone or enzalutamide, 91%. Uh, 
Uh, there were more men in the lutetium arm who had progressed after both abiraterone and enzalutamide, 21% versus 9%. So perhaps a higher sort of adverse features in the lutetium cohort at baseline. Uh, around 50% had ECOG-1 and uh, PSA around 100 median in uh, both arms. Uh, Progression-free survival, either uh, by PSA or radiographic, uh, was delayed in men randomized to lutetium PSMA with a hazard ratio of 0 0.63. So another way of saying that is that there is a 37% uh, delay in time to progression with lutetium PSMA. Uh, if we look at these curves, we do see an interesting phenomenon that we'll probably deep dive into the Q&A a little bit more detail, but the curves separate a little bit then uh, touch and then separate uh, again. So our median PFS is somewhat similar at 5.1 months. But at 12 months, there's quite a big difference between the two arms. Uh, almost all men randomized to carbazitaxel having progressed, only 3% having not progressed, compared to 19% uh, with lutetium PSMA. And that's a highly significant difference with non-overlapping confidence intervals at that 12-month period. And if we look at the curves, we see that that sort of persists uh, out with time. There were only 90 deaths in total across both groups, which was immature to trigger a pre-planned analysis of survival. Uh, this is objective response rate using CT scanning, uh, resist 1.1, and a partial or complete response occurred in 49% of men randomized to lutetium PSMA compared to 24% uh, who received carbazitaxel. Uh, again, a large difference uh, in that endpoint. Uh, side effects uh, were uh, favored lutetium PSMA. The key number is on the bottom row, 33% uh, grade three to four adverse events, not necessarily attributed to drug, but just any grade three to four adverse event reported in this population uh, in men randomized to lutetium uh, compared to 54% randomized to carbazitaxel, actually who received carbazitaxel. This is the safety analysis. Uh, so this is a subset of men who re only received the drug in each arm. Uh, so that's a significantly lower rate of more severe G3 to four adverse events. We can see greater thrombocytopenia uh, with lutetium PSMA and greater neutropenia with carbazitaxel. Uh, and other adverse events sort of as expected uh, for both treatments. There were no treatment related deaths and only uh, one patient discontinued uh, lutetium because of toxicity. One of the neat things about this uh, trial is ANSUP uh, put in a uh, really robust collection of patient reported outcomes. There were very detailed questionnaires uh, performed, you know, I think every uh, six weeks uh, in men in this trial and uh, several of these domains significantly favor lutetium PSMA. So a lot of the side effects that patients report with carbazitaxel were much or less or really not experienced with lutetium PSMA. Side effects like skin rash, sore hands and feet, hair loss, altered taste, dizziness, urinary symptoms, uh, diarrhea, and then insomnia, fatigue, and uh, social functioning. And they were the ones that were significantly different, and they were really a very large difference. And then if we look at pretty much every other patient reported outcome, they may not be statistically significant, but they pretty much all uh, head in the direction favoring lutetium PSMA. So we measured 47 symptoms, and when they're all in the direction of lutetium PSMA, I, I think that in itself is a, a significant finding. Uh, a neat way of showing this is a measure called deterioration-free survival. This is a measure that looks at a 10-point or more deterioration in global health status using the EORTC QRQC30 or progression or death or treatment discontinuation. And here we see a Kaplan-Meier survival curve of that, and it favours uh, lutetium PSMA 617 significantly. So it's six months, 29% uh, being a deterioration free compared to 13% with carbazitaxel and that difference persisting out to 12 months. So the strength of this study is that it is the first randomized control trial of lutetium PSMA 617. Uh, we chose a highly active control arm. This was a pretty much a bold move back, bold move back in 2015 when ANZUP designed this study. Uh, we selected men very carefully with PSMA and FDG PET. I see that as a huge strength of the study. And uh, we see a large difference in the primary endpoint and multiple secondary endpoints. Uh, we await further follow-up of this cohort to define overall survival. That is a weakness here. And we also await the results of the vision trial. This is the uh, AAA Novartis 
uh, phase three trial that we're hoping uh, will report sometime uh, this year. And that will give us uh, data on overall survival and uh, phase three data. This was an unblinded study of all patients withdrew in the control arm. Uh, but the overall clinical impressions is that this is a favorable treatment option uh, compared to carbazitaxel in a selected group of men who have high PSMA expression and therefore a potential alternative to uh, carbazitaxel. Uh, so in conclusion, the therapy study showed that in men with progressive disease following docetaxel, uh, lutetium PSMA 617 was more active with fewer uh, severe adverse events and patient reported outcomes favoring lutetium PSMA. Uh, I've got no doubt this represents a new class of effective therapy uh, for men with prostate cancer. And uh, an acknowledgement to our uh, funders, PCFA, uh, Movember, uh, uh, Endocyte, now Novartis, uh, uh, who own PSMA 617, provided it for this trial, also provided financial support, and Stofel providing uh, lutetium uh, 177, uh, NHMRC Clinical Trial Centre, Artnet, and we'll hear uh, some snippets from all these supporters and a big shout out to the patients, their supporters, uh, all our PIs and investigators. Uh, we put together this nice infographic uh, summarising the results of this uh, trial that uh, has got quite a bit of attention uh, on uh, social media. So a really uh, a great uh, summary of the trial. Uh, so I might pause there and... Uh, Hand over to uh, Declan for a minute. Well, thank you, Michael, and congratulations uh, to you and everybody involved in putting this uh, study together. So we now have a, a great opportunity uh, coming up to dive a bit deep into this uh, and consider the, um, the the messages in this, uh, the challenges that uh, still exist in this patient population and where we go with this therapy. But before uh, we get to your questions, and Michael will have a look at what's coming up on the screen, we'd like to um, have a few quick words from some of the uh, key people who helped put this together. And I'll first ask uh, Jeff Dunn, uh, who is the Chief Executive uh, of the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, uh, to come on the line and say a few words. Good morning, Jeff, and welcome. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Declan, and uh, good morning, everyone. Well, well, first up, can I just congratulate uh, Michael and Declan and, and the Prostate Cancer Foundation for pulling this webinar together. It's terrific, especially to see so many people from so many countries. And, and of course, can I join with everyone in, in congratulating the therapy team for some outstanding work. And these results are indeed, you know, game changing and, and welcome, uh, terrific stuff. You know, the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia works on awareness, support <clears throat> and research. And in our research, we're interested in epidemiological and basic research survivorship, and of course, clinical. And, and when it comes to supporting clinical research, um, our partnership with ANZARP uh, is critical. And a shout out to Professor Davis there. I, I can see him uh, looking bright and fresh this morning. Uh, hands up allows us to access the, the brightest and the best uh, in Australia when it comes to research activities for Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia and, and scientists that are looking and researchers that are looking at new and novel uh, answers to intractable questions. Uh, and we value that partnership uh, very much. It allows us to direct community funds uh, to making a difference and to translating new knowledge uh, into these game-changing treatments. When we think about <clears throat> when we think about the community return on investment for donations they give to the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, therapy is a shining example of an outstanding return on investment. And I think uh, PCFA's partnership with ANZA uh, demonstrates exceptional value for community for community donors when it comes to making a difference in prostate cancer research and survivorship and outcomes. Again, uh, congratulations to all involved and from PCFA, it's been a great pleasure uh, to be a collaborator. Thank Thanks, you very everyone. much. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And thank you to everyone at PCF for enabling this type of work, uh, along with your other partners. Uh, you also funded the Pro-PSMA study, uh, the diagnostic study we published in Lancet last year. So we're very grateful to you. And we will hear from uh, Paul Valanti from November in a moment. But first, I'd like to welcome yeah. uh, Margaret McJanet. Uh, Marg McJanet, who's the Chief Executive uh, Officer of ANZUP, uh, the Cooperative Trials Group that uh, enabled this. Marg, good morning and welcome. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Michael and Declan, for inviting me. 
Um, yeah, I think uh, adding to Jeff's words, therapy was really uh, another great example of how ANZA can actually bring together uh, through our membership great ideas um, with uh, uh, the support of and, and facilitation. Uh, we can actually go on to develop uh, these exciting, innovative ideas uh, to bring to the community. And none of that could happen without, as Jeff said, the, the funding support and the, and the dedication of our members and our great collaborators and uh, to, to bring these wonderful trials to the community. Mm. So uh, I think I know more about nuclear medicine than I've ever uh, cared and thought I would come to know, but uh, it's been an exciting journey and uh, a great tribute to the, to the commitment of our members. Thank you, Morgan. Thank uh, thanks to everybody at ANZ for enabling this and other fantastic studies uh, in GU Oncology around Australia. Um, now let's go um, overseas and uh, speak to Jermo uh, Jerike. So Jermo um, is the Chief Medical Officer at uh, AAA uh, Novartis, who of course are the, uh, the people who own uh, PSMA 617 and who've been fantastic partners uh, in enabling these trials. And Jermo has a long history working in this field and knows a lot about this therapy area, unlike people like me who are very new to it. So Jermo, uh, good morning. Where are you? Switzerland, I think, uh, today, and welcome. Thank you, Declan. Thank you for uh, allowing me to join this illustrative uh, panel here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak on behalf of Endocyte AAA and Novartis. We're very happy to see this uh, pioneering work come to such great uh, conclusion with the data. Very impressive. I want to congratulate the entire team and obviously Michael and Declan uh, you, for you for pioneering it. The, the great collaboration between nuclear medicine and oncology is a, a milestone in uh, prostate cancer care for patients. And we're, we're extremely happy to see that uh, come to life. Uh, we hope to see similarly impressive data from the vision study sometime later this year and then to see how we can uh, combine these two great studies that complement each other with uh, slightly different inclusion and uh, treatment algorithms. So very much looking forward to uh, further data coming out for prostate cancer and uh, PSMA. Happy to be here. And uh, again, congratulations and many thanks to the entire Thank you very much, uh, Jermo, and I'm sure we'll be diving into Vision and the other ongoing trials of Lutetium PSMA in our big discussion coming up uh, in just a moment. Um, let's now welcome back to Australia to Sean Jenkinson. Sean is the Chief Executive Offer Officer of ANSTO, uh, the Australian Nuclear and Scientific Group who uh, provided the Lutetium 177 for this study, so another key partner in enabling it. So, um, Sean, good morning. Hi Declan and Michael and hello everyone online. Look, first of all, again, I'll add my uh, thanks to yourselves, uh, Prostic and the Prostate Cancer Foundation for hosting the webinar today. I'd also like to particularly recognize um, Ian Margaret and the team at Hands Up for the contribution, endless and tireless work that they've put into making this possible. It's been fantastic. And of course, to all the other collaborators that have participated to really come together and support this trial. Um, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, some of you will know, obviously, is the home of nuclear science and technology in Australia. We operate the Opal multi-purpose reactor. And one of its key mandates, of course, is creating medical isotopes, not least of which is non-carrier lutetium, which, of course, has been used in this very important trial. Um, it's important to recognise that, from our point of view, investigator-led trials are a critical component and complement to industry-sponsored trials and therapy is such a wonderful example. So about 10 years ago, ANSTO committed to capital investment, which meant that we were able to start manufacturing lutetium about five years ago. And I want to also call out our board at ANSTO for their support of this trial, and particularly Andrew Scott, who's very vocal and passionate about the support of this trial. It's difficult to overstate how important work like this is, and we look forward to continuing to support um, trials such as this in Australia and look forward to seeing these therapies benefit Australians because we have to remember on the end of all of this our patients and families which is often the reason we do what we do so it's it's great to be here with you today and congratulations on the wonderful work. Thanks Sean we are so appreciative for your support you know therapy would not have happened without lutetium supply and uh, 
it's such a benefit to have that locally uh, in Australia. Uh, next, I'd like to hand over to Paul Valanti. Uh, Paul Valanti is the Executive Director of uh, Movember, uh, a big supporter of prostate cancer research uh, all around the world and also supported the, the pro-PSMA trial. So a few words from Paul. Thanks, Michael. And like my colleagues, congratulations to uh, all of the therapy team. It's, uh, it's just outstanding work and uh, certainly from Movember's perspective, really pleased to be able to support it alongside um, other funders as well. So I think from Movember's perspective, obviously, it's an organisation that uh, is funding a search uh, across many countries. I think this has been a really great example of the community um, you know, collaborating in an effective way, keep building on effort around the world. And, uh, and I know Howard and the team have, uh, have played a key role in, uh, in, in, in encouraging the community to, to uh, collaborate rather than compete so that we can get results faster for patients. So I'd continue to uh, encourage the community to really keep building on that spirit. I think it's, it's a fantastic to see so many people in this community uh, working together to get results faster for our patients. Obviously, as Michael said, there's a lot of uh, important data to come out this year, but for, from our perspective, really trying to think ahead as a, as a funder to uh, contribute in a, an appropriate way to getting um, you know, this work into the, into the clinic and, and the challenges around um, you know, clinical quality, treatment quality, how do, how do we make sure that we educate uh, clinicians and get the right patients selected uh, on, on these treatments is an area of focus that we'll, we'll certainly um, uh, invest in over the coming years, as well as I think the challenge of all of us to, to make sure that we actually get these treatments in the hands of patients in an affordable way. Uh, it, it's, it's the area that we tend to focus on last. Um, and really, uh, whilst every health system is different, um, I, I think this is a really important area for us to all strengthen our, our focus on once obviously the data comes in. So uh, from, from our perspective, we'll continue to support the great work uh, that has been uh, undertaken in this space and certainly uh, well done to everyone that's involved. It's, it's, it's just so exciting to see the progress we're making. Thanks, Thanks Paul and Michael. And uh, we've got a couple other people to uh, uh, mention. And uh, But if you have a question, there's a and a button on the bottom of your screen. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Click on it and please uh, uh, post your question because very soon we'll be uh, going to your questions. And if you want to ask your question in person, we can bring you into this panel. Uh, so if you have your camera and microphone ready and you want to do that, uh, please get ready to do that. And next up is going to be Martin Stockler, who's the uh, oncology lead at the NHMRC Clinical Trial Centre at the University of Sydney. Uh, you know, they've been the backbones uh, running this trial, doing all the data collection uh, and analysis. So, you know, a critical uh, point. So over to Martin. Well, thanks so much, Michael Declan, and it's such a pleasure to be with uh, an auspicious bunch of uh, researchers and supporters of, um, of prostate cancer. Um, so uh, I have the pleasure of uh, leading uh, the NHMRC Clinical Trial Centre's contribution to this um, study and collaborating with ANZ up in this group of leading clinicians and researchers. Um, we helped make the therapy trial the huge success that it was by bringing to bear the expertise and experience of over 220 staff who've conducted over 200 trials, including 80,000 patients um, around the world. Uh, but I think the most important uh, contribution we could make was to bring six clinical trials superpowers uh, to bear on the conduct of the therapy trial. Uh, the first one Michael's already mentioned, which is selection of the participants who were most likely to benefit from the uh, experimental intervention. The second one was random assignment to treatment uh, with the use of an optimal active control. Uh, the fourth one was rigorous pre-specification of the endpoints and statistical analysis plan. Uh, the fifth one, Michael, has also touched on, which was uh, design of quality of life methods designed to reveal the benefits of treatment, not just to show that it wasn't unpleasant. 
And uh, lastly, uh, careful attention to make sure that the claims and conclusions are strongly supported by the data that's been generated. So it's such a, a, a privilege and pleasure to see uh, this work come to rapid and definitive conclusion. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the next five to 10 years of influence that this trial is gonna have on the area. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And uh, I can tell you, I've learned an enormous amount in this journey back in 2015. I didn't know too much about uh, trial design and sitting in meetings with you and nutting through the statistics. I've become a little bit of a clinical trialist, which is unusual for nuclear medicine people. Uh, so I, I've learned an enormous amount. It's been uh, incredibly valuable to sit in all these meetings and, and sponge it all up. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Roz Francis. Now, Roz is not live. Roz is in Western Australia, and they are four hours behind us. So I think it's like three in the morning. And uh, so one of the challenges with these webinars is we pick a time that works for the east coast of Australia, US and Europe, uh, but it doesn't work for our friends and colleagues in Western Australia, unfortunately. Uh, so Roz has pre-recorded a message uh, that I'm going to play now. She's the uh, chair of the scientific committee uh, for the Australasian Radiopharmaceuticals Trials Network. I'm actually one of the scientific committee members as well. Uh, and this is a cooperative trials group, a little bit like ANZAP, uh, but very tiny. Uh, in comparison, and uh, we're hoping to grow. And uh, if we can become a fraction of what ANZUP has achieved in 10 years, uh, then we would have done an amazing job. So here is uh, Ros Francis. The Australasian Radio Pharmaceutical Trials Network was established in 2014 by the Nuclear Medicine Professional Societies in Australia, AANMS and ANZSNM, with a mission statement to promote and facilitate innovative, collaborative clinical research utilising radiopharmaceuticals for imaging and therapy. So how does ArtNet support clinical trials? This is predominantly through the ArtNet Scientific Committee, comprising nuclear medicine specialists, nuclear medicine technologists, radiopharmaceutical scientists and physicists. Some of the support for clinical trials includes protocol review or development of nuclear medicine manuals for clinical trials. So it's particularly important in multi-centre clinical trials where harmonisation is vital. ARTNET also has a camera accreditation program where an ARTNET phantom is sent to participating sites. For the therapy study, all sites were assessed for gallium-68 and fluorine-18 on their participating PET cameras. And this was to ensure that the PET camera performance was within specifications for the clinical trial. ARTNET also assists with radiochemistry manuals and quality control for the radiopharmaceutical aspects of clinical trials. And for the therapy study, this included gallium-68 PSMA-11 and lutetium-177 PSMA-617. Thank you. Thank you to Roz. Uh, so now we're going to take uh, questions and answers. And uh, we do have uh, two key uh, co-investigators of this trial on this call. Uh, we have Professor Louise Emmett, who's uh, from St. Vincent's in Sydney, nuclear medicine physician uh, extraordinaire, uh, one of the highest recruiters to the therapy uh, study and enormous experience with lutetium PSMA. And obviously Professor Ian Davis, who's the lead author and uh, medical oncologist and ANZ up chair uh, uh, and myself. Uh, so we might, uh, we might let Louise answer the first question and we might start with the question that's got the highest number of votes for the moment, but please uh, continue to ask your questions. But we have a question from Meltem Kaglar, uh, and the question is, in the therapy study, patients in the PSMA arm had quite strict selection criteria, dominant lesion SUV max over 20, all sites of metastatic disease SUV max over 10. Maybe you can clarify that, Louise. In our clinical practice, we see quite a few patients with PSMA dominant disease with a few FDG greater than PSMA positive sites. Should these patients be disqualified for treatment in everyday uh, practice? Uh, Louise, would you like to uh, take a lead on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And the whole question is how we could choose an SUV max of greater than 20 um, and how much mismatch we should accept is, is really difficult. And with partial voluming effect, um, you know, when does it become too small to identify whether the, the lesion is not PSMA AVID or whether it's uh, just, just small and therefore not expressing as much as we need. We, we actually based the SUV max of greater than 20 on some previous work uh, that we've done that showed that we didn't get a great response if you had an SUV max that was, was lower. 
But I think, Michael, you'd agree, if you've got high FDG activity and it's not actually um, uh, mismatched as such, those patients don't do particularly badly. It's when they're mismatched uh, and you've got a site that's really not going to get any treatment response because it doesn't have a PSMA receptor, you're not going to have any treatment response for that area, that area will grow. Um, the, they're the ones that we excluded. And I think, Michael, you did some great work looking at what happens to those patients, um, you know, yeah, those patients that didn't get on the trial in your first study. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, you know, you did not need an SCV max of over 10 at every site of metastatic disease. That was measurable sites. So it was CT, soft tissue, sort of two centimetre and lymph nodes. Uh, but we did, we were pretty strict in the therapy trial. Uh, Perhaps uh, the vision trial will give us, you know, a different set of data, the different parameters. In the vision trial, uh, I think the intensity was greater than liver uh, and didn't use quantitative PET markers, so probably included a, a broader group of patients. Uh, so we will get some uh, complementary data. Uh, as a phase two study, we really wanted to select patients most likely to benefit from this treatment. So we did go a bit strict. Uh, we wanted to get great results from a smaller patient cohort it is one of the real strengths being able to uh, see what we treat with uh, Theranostics. Uh, so this is sort of a slide of the phenotypes uh, and uh, we will be able to follow this up further because the 30% of patients that we excluded from the trial uh, do have some follow-up. That has not been analysed yet, but they uh, were followed up for overall survival and also what treatment they had next and whether or not they had a response to that, that treatment. Uh, so we'll be able to look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, in a very small cohort to date, we described very poor outcomes in these patients, actually a median survival of, of 2.5 months. Uh, I expect it might be a little bit better in this cohort uh, compared to our first phase two trust trial that really included uh, people that were really uh, quite unwell. Ian, did you want to add anything on that point? Uh Sorry, I was just answering a question in the chat, right. Michael, so I was a bit distracted from the No, that's okay. We might move to Stephen Hull. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, how were the PSA, PFS curves affected by the seven patients in the Lutetian PSMA 617 arm uh, who experienced exceptional response? Uh, we haven't specifically analysed that, but it is fair to say that for those seven men Lutetium PSMA became an intermittent therapy. Six of those seven men did recommence lutetium therapy upon progression. Uh, so the concept here is that you don't necessarily need to give all six cycles every six weeks, but perhaps you give three cycles and then you pause for three months and then you start the cycles again. And I think that is quite a good way to do it. Uh, it may ultimately improve overall survival and lead to better outcomes. It does pose some challenge for trials, particularly randomized trials like this. And if we had PFS as the primary endpoint, uh, I, I think that would pose a challenge as well, because we're effectively saying we accept some progression uh, in those patients. We don't mind. You're going to progress, but we'll wait and then treat you again. Uh, so we might need to get Martin Stockler and the statisticians at... Uh, NH and MRC CTC one day to uh, just sub analyze those patients. But I think the numbers will be really small and it certainly won't be statistically significant, but it may be interesting just to pull those patients out and rerun the curve. Sometimes with a Kaplan Meyer survival curve, if you pull out only 10 patients, you can just actually make them a, a big dip. It'll be interesting to see whether if you did get rid of those patients, would it get rid of that merging of the PFS curves in the middle? Uh, it's plausible. I don't know the answer. Any thoughts, Martin? Yeah, um, Michael, uh, it's Ian. So uh, Chris Parker asked a question about this in the in the chat. Um, and there's some data in the appendix on page 20 about time to retreatment for the exceptional responders. And the shortest time uh, from the last cycle until retreatment was 105 days. The longest was 553. So these are patients who would come up quite late in the PFS curve, I think. Yes, and this is a group of, you know, around 10% of men, it seems, uh, that for reasons that we don't really understand, have uh, very deep and rapid responses to lutetium PSMA. Often after two or three cycles, we are seeing, you know, PSAs uh, approaching zero sometimes, but over 95% reduction in PSA. And it is 
durable for somewhere in that range, but it can be up to up to a year in some cases. Uh, and although that's a small group of men, they're a really important group uh, because they just do so well. Uh, Louise, do you have any comment on those exceptional responders? Um, no, I, I, look, I, I, the comment I've got is that um, it's, it's very interesting. Some men do have this very deep response uh, and then occasionally they can have a deep response and then rebound with PSMA negative disease. So I don't think it's the entire story to, um, if you have a deep response, it doesn't mean you have a very long response. A lot of the men who had very long responses on this trial just, you know, uh, had very progressive, continuous responses over the six courses of the disease. So I do think it will have an effect on progression-free survival in that tail uh, that we see with men who do well, but it's not the whole story. Uh, and I, you know, we've got a lot of unpicking to do to find out, you know, whether it's just homogeneous disease with every uh, cell being very PSMA avid that causes these very deep responses or whether there's something more profound going on in the genetics of the cell that really helps them. Uh, you know, a lot more work to be done to see if we can really stretch out these responses for as long as possible uh, with, this, with this treatment and target it better. One of the questions that comes up very frequently in this discussion increasingly is about the use of FDG uh, for selection criteria. I can see Melton Kagler has asked a question about the strict inclusion criteria, Michael, and all the CRPC trials of lutetium we've been running here, we have been very strict about uh, patients having um, no evidence of discordant disease on PSMA and FDG and having adequate PSMA expression, which means, you know, typically close to 30% of our CRPC patients get excluded from all the trials. So one of the key questions is, well, is that too strict? How do we know that maybe some of these patients with some discordant disease mightn't benefit from having the PSMA avid disease uh, uh, targeted? We'll see in the vision study what might happen because of the, those patients do not have an FDG PET. But can I, can I throw it to you and and uh, this group to say, is it really necessary? Are we being too strict uh, by insisting on these uh, inclusion criteria? Or is it just making sense? It's an imaging biomarker, it's an imaging directed therapy, and we should stick to our guns on this. Yeah, we don't know the answer to these questions. I think, uh, you know, this is the first randomized data we have, and we'll uh, have the vision trial soon, and then more data, and we'll be able to to nut some of these things out. And actually one of the other topics that I was speaking at Memorial Strong Kettering a few hours ago and, and, and the topic came up about, well, what about microscopic disease, disease we don't even see yet? What about the high risk? What about adjuvant studies? Um, uh, do we think that if you just give this as a, an IV infusion without even doing a PET scan in a high risk population, it might benefit? Uh, what, do, what do you think about that? Uh, and we've seen a grant uh, coming through recently about this, uh, the idea that we don't use imaging at all to select these patients. We just presume there will be some PSMA overexpression. Uh, will that be sufficient, uh, even if there's not a big target lesion, to bring some lutetium to the lesion? It's a question that investigators are asking uh, in, the, in the fallout from this type of study. Do we even need a positive PET scan? Yes. Yeah, no, they're all great questions. Uh, we have a question on perhaps a little bit on this theme from... Uh, Alex Wyatt, uh, let me just give a click so that I can read out the question. Uh, I was going to try to invite people to join the panel to actually ask their question. Uh, it gets a bit tricky. I will try to promote you, Alex, to join the webinar panel, but I don't know if you actually have your microphone and camera uh, uh, ready. That might be a bit hard to put you on the spot. Uh, oh, you are joining. Uh, do you want to ask your question uh, yourself? Just turn on your microphone, Alex, if you if you can. And if you can't, within the next couple of seconds, I'll ask the question on your behalf. Maybe you don't have your microphone ready, but your question was for the large majority of patients that were not eligible for the trial based on PSMA PET scans, 91 patients. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Alex. I got, I got booted off back again. Hi, hi, Michael and hi, team. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Ask yeah, my, question. my question kind of in line... In line with what you've just discussed, I'm wondering about the proportion of patients that were not eligible for the trial on the basis of the scans. Um, how these patients fare with standard of care in general, um, whether, they're, whether they're getting benefit from a second taxane, for example. And then of course, this, this links back into the previous question, which is um, if they're not getting much benefit, is that a rationale to be treating them anyway with lutetium PSMA? Um, or a similar uh, radionucleotide approach um, in the hope that they do get some benefit. Louise or Ian, do you want to make a comment on that? Um, Ian, do you want to comment? Oh, I'm quite happy to comment on that. I, I, look, I 
nothing that we haven't teased out at all who will or will not benefit. Um, obviously, for the trial, we wanted to compare a very active agent to lutetium PSMA. So we wanted to we wanted to target it to the people who we thought would best benefit. It doesn't mean that anyone with uh, PSMA intensity scores less than we're enrolled in the trial won't benefit. And I do think the vision trial will be very, very interesting in that in terms of looking at the treatment response. Uh, and I do think that some of these men who have mismatch will still benefit, particularly if the mismatch that you identify as oligometastatic and you can treat that in another way. So uh, definitely we've got a lot of, you know, we need to work on um, whether it's important to do the, well, I think it's important to a PSMA pet to look to see what the target looks like. Uh, the FDG is quite good prognostically, but whether it should exclude patients is something that we need to do more work on. Yes. Thanks, Louise. I, I, I just expand on that. So the, the basic eligibility for this trial were men uh, where a decision had already been made that the next most appropriate treatment would be cabazitaxel. And the information that's available to us is that uh, patients who have um, significant FDG uptake and particularly uh, mismatched FDG uptake are much less likely to do well with lutetium PSMA. So we did not want to disadvantage those patients um, by putting them on lutetium PCMA, have them progress and then possibly be unable to receive cabazitaxel down the track. Now, of course, that also has the effects of um, selecting a group of patients that's more likely to do well with lutetium PCMA, but I think that's entirely appropriate. Yeah, one of the things we've done in this study is there is a large translational component that, that hasn't been analysed yet. So I've just promoted Arun Azad to the panel who's uh, looking after the translational endpoint. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, so I'm the um, the uh, translational chair for ANZA. Um, and so I think one of the really exciting things, um, you know, about the, the study is that we uh, we did collect um, and we future-proof the study by collecting serial plasma samples um, as part of the design. So we have plasma samples at baseline, uh, 12 weeks on therapy and at disease progression. Um, and we have about 10 mils of plasma at each time point and a cell pellet. So, you know, I think one of the things we need to do is to identify predictors of, um, of response, understand resistance mechanisms, understand maybe early, um, uh, you know, improve on treatment monitoring. And so we've got an opportunity to do some really, um, some really cool CT DNA analysis using that plasma uh, and looking at other, you know, biomarkers, lipidomics and, and, and other non-genomic biomarkers that I think will help us address that um, sort of question. Uh, Michael, you know, when you see um, the high activity of lutetium PSMA with the high, you know, high PSA response rates, um, but know then that the durability of response can be a challenge in some patients, you know, it speaks to the fact that we need to uncover those res resistance mechanisms and also under un understand who are the exceptional responders um, before treatment starts. Um, so hopefully that, you know, the, the, the analysis that we've got planned with, with the plasma and CT DNA will, Help address some of those uh, some of those questions, and I think it will also complement the the use of uh, perhaps Louise and Michael want to comment on this, the use of you know PSMA PET, but also FDG PET to predict response, you know to predict uh, predict response or uh, or, prog or prognosticate. You know, I think in other cancers we see that FDG PET is a powerful prognostic tool, and one of the real strengths of this study is that FDG PET data was also collected not just for selection but also in the patients who went on on therapy. So, you know, Louise and Michael, I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether FDG PET you know, is a useful is a useful biomarker. For example, maybe PSMA PET positive FDG negative patients will do better than PSMA positive FDG positive patients. That's just a theory, but I think it'd be really interesting to integrate the the, the CT DNA analysis with the uh, with the PET um, with with the PET predictors. Uh, thanks, Arun. Uh, uh, Louise, I was going to say if you want to ask, but no, I think FDG PET is a great prognostic indicator. Um, and, and this is something we need to look at in the translational uh, studies and also to all the other prognostic indicators um, that we can use at a cellular level uh, to sort of perhaps even develop some nomograms. So when, when patients are being considered for this kind of treatment, we can actually really precisely determine uh, how well they're gonna respond and for how long and whether that we need to use other combinations to better treat them. Thanks, Louise. Now, Michael, there's a bunch of great questions flying in here. You've got 20 or 30 questions there. So perhaps we can do a, a, some rapid fire uh, getting through these questions and uh, maybe you can throw out to your expert panel. Uh, let's see how many we can get through. First question. Will a recording of this webinar be made available at a later date? Yes. Uh, we'll yes, be. we will tweet that out later today. Uh, as usual, it'll sit on uh, the Prostic YouTube channel and, and DEC PCF. 
Declan also has a podcast called GU Cast, and we it usually becomes an episode in GU Cast. Uh, next question: Did you analyze which patients respond better, worse, based upon their genomic mutation slash profile? Well, I think Arun sort of answered that. Uh, we have not done that to date, uh, but it will be done. So that'll be some incredible data from this uh, study. Uh, Chris Parker asked, how long was treatment suspended for in the exceptional responders? I think uh, Ian Davis pulled those numbers out for us. Thanks to you, Ian, for doing that. Uh, Mal Salvati asked, what percentage of patients in each arm had prior taxane? The answer to that, Ian? Uh, all of them, that was an eligibility criterion. Yes, so everyone progressed after a taxane and obviously nobody in the lutetium arm uh, progressed after carbazitaxel. Uh, Rick Davis, how do the experts think differing PSMA agents currently in trial will impact results of uh, radionuclide treatment. Louise? Oh, you need to unmute yourself, Louise. Oh, and then I'm going to ask, what was that question? Uh, how do the experts think differing PSMA agents currently in trial will impact the results of radionuclide treatment? Look, I think the the for the um, for the uh, differing agents in terms of actinium and lutetium, or differing agents in terms of fluorinated PSMA or um, or gallium PSMA. We use gallium PSMA for this, and I don't think if you use a fluorinated PSMA for prediction, it's going to be too much different. Uh, and then the different agents, uh, certainly how much response you get depends on how well it binds to the cell. Um, it depends on how the, the target, whether you're using actinium or um, lutetium, as to what uh, cell death rate you're going to get. I think it's going to be very different uh, based on whether you use an actinium agent or whether you use lutetium. And the different ligands, um, I think we're just starting to explore different ligands, um, and some of them might bind much more tightly. Uh, and it, it's really uh, probably incremental changes, uh, but it'll be very interesting to see. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Rick Davis. Uh, uh, no, actually, we might throw to Samir Ezidin, uh, who's a nuclear medicine colleague. Uh, uh, when progression occurs in the PR in the lutetium arm, it was dealt with reinitiation of uh, lutetium therapy. Uh, continued stabilization has not been included in PFS analysis, I guess. Real outcome was therefore even better with lutetium PSMA. I think that's actually a fair comment. So I think we've sort of addressed that, that uh, PFS uh, as an endpoint, given that we did allow treatment to be paused, is, is becomes not a relevant endpoint for those a small group of uh, patients. Uh, Meltem Kaglar uh, has another question about uh, after the negative ERA223 study. So this was the study radium-223 in combination with abiraterone uh, that showed that it was inferior to, to uh, uh, the control arm alone. Most medical oncologists are reluctant, I think unnecessarily, to combine lutetium PSMA with second generation uh, anti-androgens. Do you think this combination is a strength or weakness? Well, I'm definitely throwing that question to Louise because uh, she is probably the world expert uh, on that question. It's a good question. So I, I think that um, radium-223 and lutetium PSMA are quite different in their mechanisms of action. One works directly on bone. And, and I think one of the problems with uh, some of the combination trials with abiraterone and radium was that you got more fractures. Um, I definitely think that there's a great interaction within the cell between the antigen receptor and uh, PSMA receptor that we can use to turbocharge uh, treatment responses. Uh, I think it would be very disappointing if we didn't explore that. And we're definitely doing that with the NCP trial at the moment with ANZUP, uh, where we're doing a randomized trial of envolutamide versus envolutamide plus lutetium PSMA in men at high risk of early treatment failure with envolutamide alone. So I, I definitely think we should look at that. And, um, and I, I'm not worried at this stage about the dangers. And obviously, ANZUP's a great team, and, and they'll be looking very closely for any adverse events. And, and I would like to make the point that uh, in that radium trial, you know, the outcome that was inferior related to, I think, fractures, actually uh, benign fractures in the group with radium plus abiraterone. And some, you know, that is not a concern that I have with uh, lutetium therapy. I, I think that happened in the radium arm because radium actually targets bone cortex and it targets normal bone uptake. 
uh, and lutetium, certainly we get zero uptake in the bone cortex. So I don't think that's a risk at all uh, with lutetium uh, uh, at all. Uh, Prab Taka, who's a radio Michael, can yep. I just? Go ahead. Go ahead, Louise. Oh, I was just going to say, um, in terms of the fractures, in the group who had bone sparing agents uh, in that trial, um, they actually didn't have an increased risk of fractures. So I do think that looking at bone sparing agents and um, being very careful with osteoporosis and, and management of osteoporosis is an important thing. Yep. Uh, Prab had a question. Do you think other diagnostic agents uh, beyond gallium 68 PSMA 11, like F18 based uh, PSMA agents would be suitable? Uh, Maybe I can address that one. You know, at Peter Mac, we use both gallium PSMA 11 and uh, F18 uh, DCF PYL. And uh, I think they're both equivalent. And there's PSMA 1007. They're all small molecule ligands. Uh, and for imaging, they're all excellent. Gallium PSMA 11 was FDA approved uh, at UCLA, UCSF uh, about two or three months ago, uh, which is great news. I think that will accelerate the field. And uh, I expect that DCF PYL will similarly be FDA approved sometime uh, this year and uh, in different parts of the world uh, due to regulatory and uh, infrastructure and distribution networks. I think a variety of these will be used. And I think when uh, this is rolled out, I think they'll all be pretty similar. In Australia, there is a uh, funding application through our MBS, through our National Healthcare Service to fund PSMA PET scans. And that is a agnostic application. So it's not for gallium or fluorine, it's just for any of these uh, PSMA small molecules. So I think on the imaging side, they're all equivalent. The therapy side, however, you know, is very different really. You know, we need to study them a lot more carefully. Uh, I just want to throw back to Germo because we didn't let, give him a chance to talk. I'm interested in his perspectives around patient selection uh, and the vision trial and how the therapy and the and the Novartis uh, vision trial may be complementary. Ah, oh, Gomo, you just need to unmute yourself. That's yep, yep, sorry. Um, Spacebar didn't work. So um, thanks, Michael. Uh, I think there are some subtle differences and hopefully we can cross analyze and merge data to really tease out the differences. Uh, as, as Ian mentioned, uh, patients selected for therapy were candidates for cabazitaxel. Controversially, patients selected for the uh, vision study were not candidates for next line chemotherapy. Uh, we don't know yet how many patients had two lines of chemotherapy prior to joining vision. On the radiographic and uh, PET uh, inclusion criteria, we obviously didn't have the FDG image in the vision inclusion, but patients who had PSMA negative CT positive lesions were excluded. And I think it will be very interesting to cross read the scans with uh, available data, obviously we missing the FDG on the vision, but at least the other way around, we can, we can in a way, hopefully reread uh, the, the therapy data and, and look what proportion of patients would have been included in vision and how do the patients do that have a marginal inclusion uh, criteria. So I, I'm really looking forward and I, I also am looking forward to the work Arun and the team are doing I think we have a lot more to learn on the patient profiles, uh, genetic and otherwise, to include the best suited patients into these trials and then into clinical practice with PSMA. And Germo, there's a lot of anticipation about the study. Uh, Dr. Sartor mentioned to me recently that he thinks it may fall in the ASCO timeframe. Can you give us any uh, update on that? Well, I can't give you any update on ASCO, yes or no, but we are looking forward to data readout in the first half of this year. Um, keep fingers crossed. It, it may be ASCO, it may not be ASCO. I think it's a, it's a tight race against uh, some very hard deadlines imposed by the ASCO. Okay, thanks, Gemma. A question from Adam Sharp. Uh, really wonderful stuff. Any data on PSMA state of progressing disease sites? Uh, any emergence of PSMA negative disease? Uh, Ian, you, uh, do you want to make a, a, a comment on that? 
emergence of PSMA so negative disease? The question's about... Yes, so there's um, a couple of situations where that can happen. PSMA expression is quite dynamic. And so our exceptional um, responders obviously had disease disappear. So they had no disease expressed here. Um, patients can downregulate uh, PSMA. So in that situation, there's no benefit from giving a PSMA targeted therapy. Uh, and those patients were also suspended and offered retreatment on progression if they be with lutetium PSMA, if they became positive again. And if not, then they came off study and were treated usually with cabaz or uh, So it might be a good thing because you've um, downregulated the cancer and what's left behind is not progressing. It might be a bad thing because the cancer has devolved and your therapeutic target has now disappeared and you need to look for another approach. Uh, Louise, do you want to comment on that as well? Ah, oh, you're muted, Louise. Sorry, it's on my mute button. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, great. So look, we didn't actually do repeat PSMA PET imaging um, on the therapy trial. I, I think it would have been something lovely to do. And, and we, you know, from a, a cost constraint, we were limited uh, with that. So we don't have exit imaging to look at um, PSMA phenotypes. Um, but I think we, Michael, would also um, uh, agree that you do get low PSMA expression. You definitely get a reduction in PSMA expression in patients who get treated with lutetium PSMA because we are knocking off the brightest cells. Um, and you definitely get a mix of phenotypes that progress. Thanks, Louise. Uh, I invited Mike Sutherjee from uh, South Africa to join the panel and ask uh, his question. Mike, are you able to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Ah, with video. Oh, even hi, Mike and colleagues. Uh, thanks and really congratulations on this exciting results. Uh, really, um, we, you know, we, we, with this, uh, uh, could it be that therapy is actually a, a, a cascade or a trigger for us to start considering lutetium as a, 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 a treatment for chemo naive patients? And if that is the case, what about the side effects? Because with these results, where are we going then? Louise, do you want to answer that one? Um, so, look, I, I think for us, uh, in terms of treatment naive, we have to probably progress down a cascade chain to prove that we're better than other treatments. We've definitely proven uh, that we are, I think, equivocal to cabazitaxel in terms of treatment response, and it'll be nice to see the overall survival data from vision. Um, we, we probably, in the longer term, if we're treating treatment naive patients, we know that a um, hormone therapy works extremely well in a, a large proportion of patients who are um, you know, who have metastatic prostate cancer. And so does chemotherapy. And I think we need to prove that we're better than that. So there's a lot of trials yet to happen, I think, before we get to that space. Yeah, thanks. And Mike, you've done a lot of work with uh, actinium. Uh, wh where do you think actinium fits in the uh, treatment pathway at the moment, Mike? Do you think we should be using it, you know, in a study after lutetium or as an alternative? What, what's your evolving views on that? And thanks for that. Of course, uh, that is also a little bit uh, to be uh, still considered further. But at the moment, we do see patients that have really not done well on nutrition that we have included on actinium. There is some little success, but that success is short-lived on the other hand. So then that, that is the problem. How long should you keep them on lutetium if you're going to go to, to, to actinium at the end of the day, compared to those that have been on actinium straight away. So we really have to really try and set up what is the cutoff, but clearly does complement and can work together with lutetium the way I see it. We just have to figure out uh, when and how. Thanks, Mike. It. I promoted uh, Jean Matthew to the panel. Jean Matthew was a uh, previous fellow at Peter Mac about 10 years ago, spent a few years with us. So it's one of the nice things about running these webinars is uh, old colleagues uh, who used to be fellows here, now very senior consultants, and uh, all this work actually stemmed from gallium lutetium theranostics with neuroendocrine tumors, and John Matthew was actually pivotal in uh, setting up our early uh, voxel-based dosimetry at Peter Mac. Uh, so pleased to see you, John Matthew. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, Michael. Uh, great work. Um, I was wondering um, uh, if the patient has access to some crossover within or outside of the trial and uh, if there's any data 
that uh, came out as how they, they did on the alternate therapy. Yeah, so there was no crossover built into the trial. So if you were randomized to a carbazitaxel, uh, there was no study option to access lutetium PSMA 617. However, uh, lutetium is available in Australia off trial at other centers. You know, all our work at Peter Mac at the time were clinical trial patients only. So it was not available in our center to cross over. Uh, but there were patients who either sought therapy in other places in Australia or, or overseas. And so that did occur. We have recorded that data and we haven't analyzed it. The flip side was possible because if you progressed after uh, lutetium PSMA 617, then carbazitaxel was available as a standard of care therapy. So uh, many men did uh, cross over in that setting. Uh, we haven't included that in the Lancet manuscript. We do have at least the numbers of how many patients crossed over and we'll be able to look at that down the track and, uh, and report that back. Uh, thanks, Jean Matthew. Uh, just scrolling through the questions. Uh, You're doing well, Michael. You've got another 20 minutes or so. And if you like the questions you see, please vote them up and it'll catch his attention a bit quicker. There's two pots. There's one in the open questions and one in the answered questions, but some of the answered questions have not been asked live yet. So uh, I'm just scrolling through and uh, trying to find them because there are lots of good questions here. Uh, there was a question, what PSA level do you consider a complete response? And a patient does not need further lutetium PSMA therapy. Uh, Louise, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so in fact, that was, uh, was a really uh, tricky one uh, in terms of how you identify exceptional response on the trial. Um, and we ended up centrally using a combination of very low PSA plus minimal activity on the SPECT images after the therapy. One of the advantages of lutetium PSMA is actually get an image at the 24 hour mark of exactly where the therapy has gone. Uh, and we use that pretty extensively for the central review to identify patients who had very little disease left in conjunction with a very low PSA. And just remembering, Michael, the PSA was less than one uh, or less than two. It was one of the, one of the two plus very low expression on the PSMA SPECT images. So it had to be both together in order to be classified as an exceptional response. Yeah, and on a similar vogue, there was another question from Yehia Omar. We know that eventually all patients will progress after lutetium PSMA. So why not space out the doses to extend durability over a long period of time? Uh, why aim to achieve a zero PSA? Why not just extend the survival with quality of life and stable PSA of 100? as an example, over a much longer period of time. Uh, that's a really- That's a great provocative question. Let, let, should we throw that to Ian Davis uh, for his thoughts on it? It's all about the aims, isn't it? Having yeah, it, expectations, you know, it's an incurable condition, the quality of life is very important and we know it's good in this study, but would that be a good strategy? Would it space it out? Uh, I think that's a, a question of fundamental importance. So that, that's entirely what the aim of treatment is here to um, improve the quality of people's lives, hopefully their longevity as well. But uh, at the moment, uh, we really don't have a signal that this is going to be curative in anybody. Perhaps there will be situations where we can combine this with local therapies for oligometastatic disease or perhaps other th therapies, but we haven't learned that from this trial. So um, how best to improve that? We know that the patient reported outcomes in therapy all favoured the lutetium PSMA arm over gabazitaxel. Um, that came as quite a surprise to me. We knew that lutetium PSMA was well tolerated, but I think to get a signal of um, benefit from the patient perspective that was that strong was really a very striking message. So that's quite important. The other component of this question was whether we might be able to um, prolong duration of response or, or benefit for the patient by altering dosing intervals. The six week interval was based on um, previous studies, so fairly arbitrary, but we had experience with that. Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that. That might be uh, a very good way of approaching it. And these are all questions that should be tested in appropriate clinical trials. And of course, sometimes they don't get tested in clinical very trials. Difficult. And um, here in the Asia Pacific region, one of the peculiarities we sometimes see is, is about reimbursement, of course. Uh, and in CRPC, for example, in patients who may be going on to an AOR pathway inhibitor but have to self-fund it, uh, we see patients deciding to 
fund their Abbey Rataron for a month or two until the PSA comes down, then stop paying for it because they, you know they're paying a lot of money for this and they they watch the PSA come up and go again, go again. So sometimes there are things you just can't control for in clinical trials, and and that's where reimbursement um, uh, may have a, an influence here, of course, while we wait for it. But I think that's a re- one of the best uh, questions we've had uh, this morning, Michael. A very provocative thought uh, about spacing out the intervals. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and there are quite a few other good questions coming in. Uh, let me fire. There's another one on, I believe, from Brian McCloskey. I believe Lutetian PSMA 617 works best in less advanced patients. Uh, is there any research on hormone sensitive patients? And if so, what have you uh, learned? Uh, so Arun Azad uh, replied to that to say, great question. Now we have the upfront PSMA trial, and he's given a link to that. I think Novartis are uh, perhaps also going to. Uh, open a trial in that space. Uh, Can you tell us a bit about that, Michael, about the uh, Upfront PSMA trial, if Arun's not on the line? Yeah, so Upfront is a uh, randomized trial running at the same network of sites, randomizing men with newly diagnosed high volume disease to either Lutetian PSMA 617 followed by docetaxel compared to docetaxel alone. It's up and running. I think we've randomized 26 patients to date. Uh, It's a phase two trial. six out of the 11 sites around Australia are open uh, and it's going really well. So we don't have the results of this trial. So I really uh, can't comment. I think the hope is that, uh, you know, hormone sensitive disease is equally or perhaps more radiosensitive. So this treatment ought to work uh, in earlier stage disease. There's no reason why it shouldn't. There's certainly some compassionate access data uh, from Germany and experience. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, someone like Richard Baum on the line, uh, who's treated a lot of patients out of clinical trials and uh, uh, had some experience here. But I think, you know, we all know of case reports of men who have done well, but it, it needs to be done properly in the context of a clinical trial. Uh, and I, I don't think it should be used at all off trial uh, in this setting uh, at the moment. And one step earlier again, Brian, is that we have another phase one, two study running here called the lutectomy trial. Uh, and this is a sort of a neoadjuvant approach. It's for men with high risk, localized or node positive prostate cancer scheduled for a radical prostatectomy. Uh, and we know, of course, these men have very high biochemical failure rates and all the traditional neoadjuvant strategies using ADT plus or minus chemo or AR pathway inhibitors have failed really to improve outcomes for these patients. Uh, so in this setting, we have uh, this trial currently running uh, for men scheduled to have a prostatectomy. Uh, they have to have high SUV, high PSMA expression, um, greater than 20 in the prostate or the nodes. And then they get one or two cycles of lutetium PSMA without ADT. So it's a, it's a study with a primary endpoint of dosimetry. Where we're very interested in seeing what dose we can get into these target lesions. Uh, but the, the signals we'll see in pathological response, imaging response, PSA response may inform future strategies. So the lutectomy trial um, protocol was published in European Neurology Focus recently, um, and that's uh, that opened about six months ago and will finish later this year. Um, so very early, we'll see what it shows. I wonder about that, Michael, uh, whether uh, neoadjuvant uh, approaches with lutetium on its own or lutetium combined with ADT uh, will be uh, worthy of exploration, as Brian is suggesting. Oh, uh, earlier and earlier. Uh, Germo, do you want to make any comment on uh, other phase three trials that uh, Novartis are going to open in this space in the near future? Yeah, so we're actually in the process of opening both a pre-taxane uh, castration uh, resistant and a hormone sensitive uh, phase three study. I think these are very relevant questions and we'll, we'll see uh, what we get. I fully agree with you, Michael, those studies uh, need to be run in randomized and robot controlled fashion. Uh, Helen Gray has a question. Out of many PSMA radio uh, ligands, uh, lutetium 177 PSMA 617 seems to be Uh, one of the most uh, uh, researched. Are there any other molecules which could compete? Louise, do you want to tackle that one? Um, So I I think there's a number of other ligands that are around. Um, PSMA INT is another ligand, but it's got retrospective data with not a lot of prospective. I think there is a prospective trial that's starting. over in in the US or in Canada. Um, but I don't know of a lot of other the ligands that have really good prospective data. 
at this stage and um you know i think obviously that's what what needs to happen if people want to push other items forward thanks louise giancarlo pascali asked is there any utility or need for uh, manufacturing uh isotopes of lutetium or are we good with the gallium lutetium theranostic paradigm uh so in this trial which was a little bit unique it was set up very uh, in the early days and we do have uh, some nice hospital radiopharmacy infrastructure the lutetium psma 617 was manufactured in our hospitals uh, the lutetium came from ansto and the uh, psma 617 uh, came from novartis now and uh, it was compounded in hospital radiopharmacies. But in the future, uh, no doubt, uh, this will be different. Uh, in the vision trial, uh, uh, Endocyte Novartis made lutetium PSMA 617 centrally and shipped it to sites in a ready-to-inject syringe, uh, much like many people with radium-223 would be familiar with. You know, I think that will be ultimately the way of the future when this is a, a widely available therapy. Uh, but if you do want to do this in as smaller quantities, uh, uh, perhaps also with new compounds. Uh, I do like the Australian hospital radiopharmacy infrastructure. It is very neat. It allows us to translate things from uh, bench to bedside uh, very rapidly. Uh, we've certainly shown that it is safe uh, in the therapy study. We had a lot of robust quality control measures. And a question from Catherine Zukatinsky. What do you consider is the future? Should dosimetry be used to judge how much lutetium-based therapy to give or not? Uh, Louise, do you want to tackle a dosimetry question? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, as dosimetry is a, a core fundamental of, um, of nuclear medicine and we haven't really used it in the large trials. We've been using standard doses. Um, I think we need to um, validate really well our uh, dosimetry to ensure that we're actually not underdosing patients. Um, a lot of the dosimetry that was done earlier decided that 7.5 gigabecquerels was a standard dose for lutetium PSMA. Uh, and the question is, are we using too low doses? Are we being uh, limited by the dosimetry that was done earlier? And should we be using dosimetry now? Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done in dosimetry so that we can maximize doses, not minimize them. Um, you know, I'd really open that up to uh, Michael. What do you think? Uh, do you think we should be using dosimetry? And, and if so, how? I, I brought John Matthew back to the panel because he's my go-to dosimetry uh, man. Uh, he's given the world's highest dose of lutetium-177 to a human, I believe, not with PSMA, but with uh, lutetium dotatate for treating neuroendocrine tumours. I think he has a world record dose of, correct me, something like 37 gigabecquerels in a single administration uh, so uh, based on dosimetry. So interested in John Matthew's perspective. Yes, uh, as you know, my, as you pointed out, I'm a strong believer in dosimetry uh, based uh, radio uh, ligand therapy. Uh, it's actually, it's not pharmaceutical therapy that we're doing is radio therapy. So it should be measured the same way as external beam uh, radiation therapy. Uh, so far, we have been doing it in neuroendocrine tumor, but as we just are just beginning um, PSMA uh, therapy uh, outside of the uh, pharma trials, uh, for sure we'll look at this. Uh, we're not yet sure on which organ to, to, to base the dose pre prescription. For sure, for the tumor, there's no limit. The highest is probably the best, uh, but we would limit tumor. Uh, you, no, administered activity based on some uh, target or critical organs. Uh, so that's yet to be seen how we will uh, develop this, but uh, for sure we will. Wow, that's so right. And and Michael, how do you land at the doses in the current trials? How do you pick uh, eight gigabecquerels uh, uh, and so on? Look, we largely base that on experience from lutetium dotatate in your endocrine tumors uh, very early on and compassionate access data from Germany. Uh, there is some nice dose escalation uh, studies that have been done at Royal Cornell, where uh, I think up to around 15 gigabecquerels of lutetium PSMA 617 have been given two weeks apart, uh, showing that it's very safe. Uh, we don't know the optimal administered activity. You know, I'm a big fan of dosimetry, but I'm also strikingly aware of its limitations. I think it is complicated and it does uh, limit uh, rollout. And uh, if we want to make this treatment available to all men with prostate cancer, uh, all around the world, we need it to be very, very simple. And uh, as we designed the therapy study 
initially I actually had a little bit of a adjusted dose based on tumor burden, renal function and, uh, and body weight. And, uh, I think I realized pretty early on for a randomized trial being run in centers that maybe have never even done this treatment before, it becomes a bit complicated and simplicity is actually a good thing. Uh, on, so, on the topic of simplicity, can I ask a, a urologist question then on this topic? So when, when you and uh, Jean-Matthew talk about those symmetry, do you mean that you kind of individualize it per patient, uh, hence its complexity? You're looking at what dose goes in on the first cycle uh, and then you would adjust it. Is that, is that what you mean by dose symmetry, a very personalized one per patient, which may not be feasible? And, and if that's so, then maybe uh, Howard Sewell might comment, um, uh, there is scope to be planning very good dose symmetry studies that will just help standardize doses per patient, may, maybe based on uh, molecular tumor volume, uh, or et cetera, et cetera, so that not everybody has to do dose symmetry, but that we find a way of getting the dose up because it seems to be very well tolerated in the phase two study and the therapy study. I'm sure it will be in vision as well. So why, why don't we ramp up the dose? Um, yeah, look, I think there is room to study that, uh, but that's what we do mean. We, you know, Jean Matthews work is uh, done dose symmetry and then the next cycle is adjusted uh, based on the previous cycle, but it is rather complicated. Uh, Jean Matthew, do you want to comment on trying to roll that out in a multi-center study and the, you know, whether that's, do you think that's feasible? Uh, I think so. There's uh, us and many other groups um, in particular from Germany, they, have developed a single time point dosimetry. Uh, now, uh, quantitative spec is becoming available on commercial uh, systems uh, out of the box. So there, there are ways to uh, easily measure uh, the uh, organ doses, and uh, which we know from patient to patient, the the dose to an organ, a critical organ, versus the um, the injected activity can vary by a factor of twenty folds. Uh, so that means that if it's safe for all patients, it means that patients, patients receive well below safety threshold. So uh, certainly it's, um, it would be a good thing that to, to, to look at uh, simple uh, methods, uh, but to significantly boost tumor in some patients. Thank you. Of course. While you're talking there, we have one of our guests in studio is James Butto, uh, one of our nuclear medicine physicians. James, you're close to one of those uh, podcast mics. So <laughs> I know you're very interested in this um, uh, semi-automated quantitative measurements, and you've been working with MIM software uh, on some aspects of this. Uh, have you any thoughts on this? Uh, sorry, unprompted. We're going to turn the camera around so that you can see him. Hello, James, hey, good our morning, fellow everybody. from Canada. Um, <clears throat> Now we're working quite a bit with um, also Price Jackson and Lockheed down in physics. So for deep learning, uh, automatic organ contouring and how to converge towards the one-click solution into uh, automated uh, segmentation of PSMA, FTG, and eventually the QSpec also. So <clears throat> yeah, that may come. Get, yeah, it would be a, if we can converge towards a, a one-click solution, make things a lot easier to uh, Roll out for dosimetry, and and uh, just a thank you to Howard because James is uh, you know one of our young investigators, and uh, uh, the PCF funding and our center of excellence has really enabled us to uh, expand the team here, uh, particularly with some youngsters that are uh, super keen and enthusiastic, and and will represent the future. I, I think uh, one of the missing links here is that uh, we need more people coming into the nuclear medicine field, particularly uh, uh, on the medical side and also radiopharmacy, radiochemistry. Uh, so uh, training the next generation is a, a key thing and uh, creating these therapy type networks is just uh, fantastic for that. And on that topic, I, as you know, I'm doing a sabbatical in nuclear medicine as soon as the Australian government allows the borders to reopen because I'm, I'm part of that new young generation who are going to come in. Okay. Yes, and I'm doing a sabbatical in robotic prostatectomies. Correct. Correct. Now, Michael, we only have two or three minutes left. Um, uh, have you any uh, quick other last comments you want to deal with? We want to finish on time and uh, we want to give a chance to Howard uh, to wrap up as well. Uh, no, I think uh, it's been great. We've covered a lot of questions. There are quite a few other questions uh, on the chat. We might... I throw this back to Twitter for those that are on Twitter to answer uh, uh, some of those questions. Uh, we will do another one of these webinars in uh, probably around three months time. Uh, the question, we had a vote last time, in fact, what the webinar topic should be. And the last vote was that it should be about how to do collaborative 
uh, clinical trials between nuclear medicine, radiation oncology, medical oncology, and uh, and urology, not necessarily you know, PSMA therapy specific, but just a, a broader topic around PSMA PET imaging as well. And so that may be the theme of our next meeting. We're also going to do one on uh, AI imaging at some point uh, uh, this year as well. Deep learning, I think of all our imaging data, uh, one of the features of therapy is that we have centrally collected all the imaging data, not just PSMA and FDG PET, but all the post-therapy spec CT imaging, all the bone scans, all the CT scans, uh, all centrally collected. So rife uh, for computer-based analysis, huge amounts of data. And when we throw in the uh, blood samples as well and genomic profiling, there's really a lot of work to, to do. Uh, so I'd just like to take a, a moment to thank all the panel members, particularly all our special guests from uh, PCFA, uh, ANZUP, uh, ANSTO, uh, Novartis, uh, and I'm sure I've forgotten someone. November, and November yep. uh, for, for joining us. C and Martin Stockler from NHNMRCTC. This was, uh, I think, my best analogy is doing the therapy study was a bit like doing a team sport. Uh, there were so many different people involved with different pieces of expertise, and it was a real pleasure, sort of, to be the maybe the captain of that team uh, and made a lot of friends uh, along the way. And maybe we'll head uh, jump back to Andrea and uh, Howard at uh, PCF to have the last word. Andrea, would you like to say something? I just want to thank our Michael and Declan for organizing this wonderful webinar, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, such such wonderful insights, and of course, thanks to everyone who attended and asked questions. Um, it was just wonderful, thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I think Michael, the next, first of all, thank you for your leadership in this field, it's really awesome. Um, Germo, where every appendage is crossed three times for the outcome of the vision trial. We're all, all waiting with bated breath on that. Um, can't wait to see the actual numbers come rolling out. And I think one of the most interesting things in the field right now are the combination trials. Um, especially trials adding PARP inhibitors, for example, something else we're funding through through Shanine Sandu and, and Michael Hoffman and others at the Peter Mac. So I, I look forward in the very near future to having um, a webinar uh, as soon as we start seeing some, some results. It doesn't have to be as polished as, as this trial was, uh, Michael, but even some preliminary data from combination trials would be really cool. Yes, hopefully we'll have some data later this year, maybe even at ESMO with some of our combination trials. We'll, we'll wait and see, but uh, we have two combo trials, one with a PARP inhibitor and one with Pembrolizumab, uh, both run by uh, Shanine Sandu here at Peter Mac through, through grant uh, funds and uh, some industry support. So we'll have that data. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Michael. And Thanks, everybody. And congratulations to uh, you and everybody involved in this trial. It's been a great privilege to co-host one of these webinars again with uh, our friends at PCF. Thank you, Howard and Andrea. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. We will cross-post this as a GUcast podcast later today. And we will post the video and slides on YouTube uh, in the next 24 hours or so. So uh, stay safe and uh, thank you again. <laughs>